Good morning. It's great to be here. After 35 years in academia, I finally get to Oxford. <laughs> <laughs> um, most of my work in the past has been about the internal dynamics of uh, international migration, focusing on things like network formation and social capital accumulation, building cumulative causation into systems to give flows of migrants uh, stability over space and time. But today I want to talk about external feedback, specifically from U.S. policy in the case of the Mexico-U.S. migration stream, which has been profoundly influenced by policy as much as by anything we can study internal to the migratory process itself. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, it took me a long time in the field before I realized that policymakers, at least in the United States, don't make immigration policy intending in any way to affect immigration. Uh, they make policy uh, in accordance with domestic political concerns. And uh, immigration policies that are enacted tell you a lot more about what Americans are uh, aspiring to and hoping for or fearing and being apprehensive about than anything else. And that's kind of a background to the story I'm telling today, which goes back to um, uh, the, uh, the origins of the current migration system uh, between Mexico and the United States. Uh, really goes back to 1942, when the US finding itself once again at war, uh, mobilized uh, a full war effort and the part of this war effort involved a draft, and all the men went off to fight, and all the women worked in the factories, and that left nobody to work in the agricultural sector. So um, after deporting our Mexicans in 1929 and 1934, we went back to the Mexican government and said, gee, we're real sorry about that deportation <laughs> campaign 10 years ago, but we'd like to have you back now. And we set up a guest worker program known as the Bracero Program, which um, from 1940, operated from 1942 to 1964. And at its height, which you can see here in the late 1950s, it was bringing into uh, the U.S. about 450,000 Mexican guest workers' uh, entries per year. <clears throat> uh, this is um, a brief history of uh, Mexico-U.S. migration between 1965 and 1995. Uh, the solid line is um, legal permanent residents. Uh, the, dotted, the dashed line uh, is illegal migrants, and the dotted line is um, uh, braceros. <clears throat> so you can see that in the late 50s, uh, the United States was taking in about half a million Mexicans per year, uh, 450,000 guest workers and fluctuating around 50,000 permanent residents. Then in 1965, the United States overhauled its immigration program. And they did this uh, with noble aspirations and intentions at this time. The intent was to eliminate residual racism from the U.S. immigration system. The 1960s was the civil rights era in the United States. And uh, in the 1920s, the Congress had enacted these laws that uh, were designed to keep out Southern and Eastern Europeans. Uh, for Southern and Eastern Europeans, read Russian Jews, Italian and Polish Catholics. Um, uh, but the situation had changed by the 1960s. It was the Civil Rights Era. The 1964 Civil Rights Act had passed. The 1965 Voting Rights Act had passed. And uh, in 1965, there was a move led by Senator Kennedy and many others to uh, deracialize the U.S. immigration system. And so uh, this found favor in Congress by, because um, by uh, 1965, Congress was run by people like Dan Rostenkowski, who didn't like those anti-Polish um, uh, laws, and uh, chair of the Judiciary Committee was Peter Rodino, who didn't like the uh, anti-Italian prejudice. And so with very noble intentions, they reformed immigration law and eliminated the racially uh, discriminatory quotas. And uh, the quotas, many people don't quite understand, only applied outside the Western Hemisphere. They never applied to the Americas. So they radically reformed the immigration uh, program by giving each country uh, that had formerly been subject to quota limitations a, a neutral 20,000 per country per year uh, quota. And they set up a series of labor market and family reunification criteria to let people in. And uh, they removed the cap on uh, Asian and African and Middle Eastern uh, immigration. Uh, and uh, people say that, oh, well, the, the 65 immigration reform dramatically transformed American immigration, which it did. But uh, the two bigger 
forces were that Europe stopped sending and became the receiving uh, area. And uh, unbeknownst to um, a lot of people, uh, the 1965 Immigration Act put the first numerical limits on immigration from the Western Hemisphere, and setting a hemispheric cap of only 120,000 visas total, all countries. And uh, over the next uh, 20 years, this was ratcheted down to, until by 1976, the Western Hemisphere was covered under the 20,000 <coughs> per country per year cap. 1965, the United States also, in a spirit of civil rights, uh, terminated unilaterally the Bracero program, coming to see it as an exploitive labor program, which of course it was, uh, but something on a par with southern sharecropping and something to be eliminated in this new spirit of civil rights. So in 1965, the United States radically reformed its immigration policies uh, and really had, gave no thought, if you look at the Senate testimony, nobody said, well, what about those 500,000 Mexicans that are entering every year? What's going to happen to them? Uh, nobody said anything about that. It was just done. Uh, and that set off a chain of events, which I'll describe to you today, of f feedbacks between uh, what happened on the ground with this ongoing, well-established migration system uh, and uh, the policy framework uh, that had set what came to be in motion. So if you have uh, a 22-year guest worker program, uh, after 22 years, uh, you have a well-established migration system with people that are connected to employers, Patterns have been established, networks have been put into place, expectations have been changed on both sides of the border. Uh, so when they terminated the, the Bracero program and capped legal immigration, the flows didn't just stop. Because uh, the conditions on the ground hadn't changed. The demand was still there, uh, the networks were in place. So the flows just simply continued and as you can see, basically just resumed under undocumented auspices. And so from 1965 to around uh, 1979, there was a steady rise in undocumented or, and I'm gonna use the term illegal migration a lot because illegality is precisely the thing that um, characterized this flow and, and turned it into a political vehicle. So uh, between 19, late 1950s and late 1970s, things changed. Uh, uh, what had been a legal flow of about half a million um, uh, Mexican workers coming in per year uh, turned into a, uh, a flow where about half a million Mexicans were coming in per year, but 90% of them were now in uh, undocumented status uh, and there were therefore illegal. And with everything that illegal connotes, illegal means they were lawbreakers, illegal means they're criminals. And this set in motion within the US media and, and political spheres the rise of the Latino threat narrative. Since these people are all illegal, and they're all Latino, uh, this is a big threat to the United States. And the rise of illegal migration from Mexico, particularly in Latin America generally, uh, gave rise to this brand new narrative about the threat. And uh, the rise of a set of new uh, metaphors in the media to talk about migration. So this is from uh, Leo Chavez's book, uh, and it looks at, uh, he coded up magazine covers in the three main magazines news magazines prevailing at the time, uh, Time, U.S. News and World Report, and Newsweek. And he coded it as to whether the, the uh, covers were alarmist, uh, positive, or neutral. And uh, this is the, as you can see, over time, the frequency of alarmist covers increases uh, quite dramatically from the 70s to the 80s to the 1990s. Uh, in my work, I, I did a uh, uh, an analysis of metaphors that were being used in American, the leading American newspapers using ProQuest uh, newspaper series, where you just search on terms, variations on il illegal migrants, uh, invasion, flood, and threat. And uh, you see that in 1965, these metaphors in the media virtually did not exist. And then they, uh, between 1965 and 1979, they rose, they rise to a peak. States. Then it oscillates and, up and down. Uh, at each peak, uh, uh, there's another piece of anti-immigration legislation that's passed. And these things accumulate over time to create a very restrictive uh, immigration and border policy emanating from the United States. To show you the connection between apprehensions and metaphors, these are just the trends over time, so they're actually pretty closely uh, associated over time. The rise in metaphors uh, uh, is being driven by all of a sudden the appearance of this new phenomenon at the border, all these illegal migrants being apprehended, arrested. And uh, this really set in motion a whole uh, path-dependent dynamic. Uh, so 
uh, it, uh, um, it begins when uh, apprehensions become visible. Uh, illegal migrants aren't visible until they're apprehended, really, because you had 500,000 people coming in before working, you have 500,000 people coming in afterwards. The difference that now is that uh, instead of being nice guest workers that are shunted off somewhere, uh, they are uh, illegals and therefore a threat. And uh, political politicians can use this as a tool for mobilization. Uh, heads of the INS can use Immigration and Naturalization Service can use it as a tool to mobilize resources for their agency. Uh, and a bunch of special interests are adhering to the fact that the United States is being invaded by illegal migrants. And over time, metaphors of floods being inundated and flooded by the, this brown tide give way to martial metaphors. We're being invaded by hostile alien invaders. And during the Cold War, it gets wound up with Cold War rhetoric. And then once the Cold War ends, we end up with the war on terror. It gets wound up with terror rhetoric. So uh, I was testifying before the US Senate, and, and uh, a senator from New York gets up and basically says the Mexico-US border is the front line in the war on terror. <laughs> And he's a liberal. <laughs> so, so what what you can what happens is these uh, uh, these uh, references in the media get going. Uh, apprehensions become a newsworthy item every year. The number of apprehensions is increasing. Number of we're being invaded. Uh, uh, and the head of the immigration service goes before Congress and the media saying, I need more money, I need more people on the boots on the ground, I need more equipment, and so on. And politicians say, we're being invaded, uh, you, you, we've got to do something about this as to save America. And you, this is the simple overtime relationship between apprehensions and the percent of American citizens, or American um, citizens who uh, self-identify as conservative. And uh, I think the, this, this rise of illegal migration as a trope in American media has been a big un, kind of unrecognized factor in the shift of the United States, US opinion in a very conservative direction. So what we have here is a model that um, tests that assertion and finds supportive evidence. This comes from the general social survey, which I pooled from its inception in 1972 to through, I think, uh, 19, uh, through 2000. And then you estimate uh, the percent who identify themselves as conservatives, controlling for a whole bunch of demographic and background factors, and, 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 and the U.S. economic context, and the policy context, the number of apprehensions. And as you see, apprehensions is a very st strong, powerful predictor of people identi self-identifying as conservative. The Latino threat mobilizes conservative feelings. And, uh, and this is controlling for the U.S. Uh, policy, the, the U.S. economic context. Uh, during economic good times, people are less um, uh, uh, conservative. <clears throat> um, conservatism doesn't necessarily translate into exclusion of sentiment, uh, uh, but we don't have an annual series of questions in the general social survey about uh, uh, preference for exclusive policies. But we do have it in 1996 and 2004, which allows you to do this regression where you regress conservative sentiment on support for exclusionist policies, controlling for all these other things that were controlled before. And you find that the more conservative people are, the more supportive of exclusion uh, and repression they are when it comes to immigration. So this basically sets off this um, causal chain. Uh, and this is from a paper that I published in uh, Population Development Review uh, <clears throat> that uh, actually parameterized this process uh, we're using data from the US official statistical system uh, with one addition from, of estimates from the Mexican Migration Project. So from the Mexican Migration Project, we can come up with an independent estimate of the number of entries that are coming into the country every year. So that's our exogenous variable that serves as uh, uh, an identification for this causal loop. Uh, uh, and this is official number of apprehensions. This is from the GSS. This is from my coding of restrictive legislation and restrictive border operations. This is from Border Patrol statistics. Uh, and this is from uh, Border Patrol statistics as well. So uh, what you see is that entries uh, in 1965 start rising. That naturally produces uh, apprehensions. But the apprehensions push people to in the conservative direction, which brings about the passage of restrictive legislation, more Border Patrol agents, more line watch hours patrolling the border. Uh, and then if you've got more people with more money and more things patrolling the border looking for migrants, they catch more apprehend, they apprehend more people. And, um, even, and what happened was this, this 
a forced ex exogenous force comes to a, a plateau at about 1979. But by then, this system is already well established. And this, is, this feedback loop just keeps pushing the number of apprehensions up and up and up, even though the, the number of illegal migrants has already plateaued. Uh, and it becomes a self-sustaining cycle. So this is uh, a scatter plot showing the cum effect of percent conservative on cumulative legislation over time, which is strongly positive. Uh, and this is the effect of uh, uh, restrictive legislation on line watch hours, the number of hours spent patrolling the Mexico-U.S. border. So this, you can see over time the accumulation of restrictive laws and restrictive border operations. And this is what you end up with uh, in, in the real world. Uh, you see that uh, in, this, is, um, this is the total number of apprehensions, and this is apprehensions per border patrol officer which is a better indicator of the actual volume. So you see that uh, uh, these are uh, rising in t more or less in tandem, and then the metaphor starts kicking in and, and taking, and this feedback loop occurs. <coughs> Apprehensions, basically the inflow <coughs> peaks right in the late 1970s and fluctuates and goes down a bit, uh, but apprehensions just keep rising and rising and rising to a peak, which hits in 1986 when the U.S. passes the Immigration Reform and Control <coughs> Act to officially start the process of militarizing the Mexico-U.S. border. This is the Border Patrol's budget in constant dollars. So just to remind you what we're looking at here, um, this is when undocumented inflow peaked. Uh, this is when the war on terror starts with the 1990 uh, early 1990s bombings, uh, and then, of course, 9-11. The Mexico's border is the front line in the war on terror. <clears throat> so now I'm going to turn to data from the Mexican Migration Project to talk about, I showed you one side of the policy feedback loop, how we set in motion a, 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 an apprehension machine that became self-fulfilling and drove apprehension steadily upward, even though the number of illegal migrants was not increasing. Let's go we collect a complete retrospective life history of all spouses and, and household heads. And uh, the life history includes a complete history of apprehension and border crossing, from which we can reconstruct what was going on as time rolls along. So using the MMP data, this is my estimate. The top one is the, is the probability of ultimately getting in. And the bottom one is the probability of apprehension at the border. And uh, again, remember that um, Border Patrol uh, funding and manpower and equipment is going up exponentially. <laughs> and you see chances of getting in hover between 95 and 100 percent over a series of attempts. And there's a little rise here. There's, there's a drop here. This is when the uh, Border Patrol gets involved in the war on drugs and starts devoting their uh, uh, time to drug interdiction. And then, then it picks up again as in illegal migration becomes uh, a favored trope once more. This is the Mexico-U.S. border, in case you're not familiar with it. It's um, 3,000 miles long, about 2,000 kilometers. I mean, it, it's 3,000 kilometers, 2,000 miles long. and um, Prior to um, uh, 1986, when the Immigration Reform and Control Act passed, the vast majority of uh, uh, migrants from Mexico, it was a very stable system. It had come into existence. It just switched from documented to undocumented. But the structure of the system hadn't really changed much before 1986. 90% came through El Paso or San Diego. And the big one, by far, was San Diego. So they're crossing through Baja, California, and they're crossing through Chihuahua, and nobody is crossing here in Sonora. But when you militarize the border, naturally you target your resources to the places where there are people crossing. So the first place to militarize is El Paso. The second place to militarize is San Diego. And, and literally now they have built a three, three separate border fences uh, that road from the Pacific Ocean up into the uh, uh, the uh, Sierra Mountains, uh, 
uh, and uh, on in, in, through uh, urban Tijuana in San Diego here, they have uh, Klieg lights uh, posted at every 100 yards. They have uh, drones flying overhead. They have footfall detectors. They have infrared. Uh, they have a border patrol car, a Chevy Blazer, sitting there staring at the border every 100 yards. And um, when these militarizations were first launched, the migrants came flowing northward like they always did, and then they hit this wall of enforcement. They go, whoa, what happened? And uh, of course, migrants are not these passive little creatures. They're active, engaged, uh, rational. And if you make it very costly, difficult, and expensive, and also quite risky to cross here and here, guess what they do? <laughs> they change their crossing behavior. So this is. This is the uh, people going to a traditional border crossing, basically El Paso or uh, the California sectors. Uh, so it's between 75 and 80 percent. As it has, if you, and I could take this line back <coughs> ages, and it would be the same. And then you militarize the border with the Immigration Reform and Control Act and down uh, to, to a, a low of about 30 percent, revi uh, revives a bit, and then falls down to uh, the latest statistics is about 18, 20 percent. So you shift uh, dramatically the geography. What changes uh, is the rise of crossings through the Sonoran Desert into the state of Arizona. Arizona, prior to the border uh, militarization, had been a, a backwater, hadn't received significant Mexican immigrants since the <coughs> 1920s, and the number of crossings that occurred in the Sonora to Arizona border was in the tens of thousands uh, per year. Uh, and then suddenly it becomes the hot place for crossing. So uh, they change their crossing behavior. They also increasingly used a paid guide to help them get across uh, because uh, crossing from urban Tijuana to urban San Diego is pretty easy, really. Uh, crossing from Sonoran Desert in Ar Sonora to the Sonoran Desert in Arizona, miles from uh, civilization, is a quite another thing entirely. And by the way, this, this new crossing behavior simply reinforces the trope of a new invasion that's going on. 20,000 Mexicans arriving per week in Tijuana and crossing into San Diego don't create a big impression because uh, Tijuana's uh, about 4 million Mexicans, San Diego's about 6 million people, about 40% of whom are Mexican. So you call up you know, the INS and say, there's some Mexicans looking suspicious, the 7-Eleven in Chula, Chula Vista, California. You, you know, they're not gonna jump on their bandwagon and run out. But 20,000 Mexicans crossing the border per week in Douglas, Arizona, which is about 25,000 people total, <laughs> make a big impression. And then, and then once they're across, they're going across open ranch land. And, and they're dying, and corpses are turning up. And so the metaphor is this, there's this new, new invasion when the only thing that had changed was the point of crossing. Uh, so in addition to changing their um, geography, they increasingly turn to pain guides until it becomes a universal phenomenon. <clears throat> and of course, the services provided uh, become a lot more elaborate and the crossing costs become a lot more prohibitive. So for years, they'd average about five to $600. And then uh, after the real militarization, which is, occurs in the early 1990s with Operation Blockade and Operation Gatekeeper in El Paso and, and uh, San Diego, they just go up exponentially and they're currently um, pushing about $2,500 to $3,000 per crossing in constant dollars. So it becomes a lot costlier. Uh, it also becomes a lot riskier, because now you're, cro you're not crossing in urban areas, you're crossing in a remote desert, high desert, either or in the lower Rio Grande Valley during periods when the river's swollen. And um, these are simple counts of deaths of un un uh, unidentified border crossers in Arizona from uh, official statistics. Uh, from death registries. So you can see that there's just this massive increase in death as people shift the crossing point from Tijuana to the Sonoran Desert. <clears throat> so what happens when a self-feeding cycle gets in to kick in uh, this really repressive border policy that militarizes sectors serially, starting in the busiest and then closing in between? And that makes border crossing extremely costly and very risky uh, up to the point of death. Um, well, migrants being rational people decide to minimize border crossing. And uh, they do this not by 
staying back in Mexico, but by uh, remaining in the United States once they've crossed in. Uh, uh, you can, if, even if you're uh, a neoclassical economist, you can, and thinking of it in a neoclassical model, uh, if before it cost you 500 bucks to get into the U.S., and now it costs you 3,000 bucks to get into the U.S., and you um, make $500 a month working as an agricultural worker, uh, to make the trip profitable in the old days, you'd work one month, pay off your bill, and the rest was gravy. Now you'd have to work six months just to make the trip profitable. So just in a strictly neoclassical model, and I'm not saying that's what's going on, that's going to increase trips lengths, which is another way of saying it's going to decrease the rate of return migration. So in the end, the big effect was not to change the rate of in-migration, but was dramatically reduce the rate of out-migration. And if you do that, uh, in demography, we've got this real simple equation called the balance equation. Net migration equals in-migration minus out-migration. If you have this massive policy intervention that doesn't affect in-migration, but dramatically reduces out-migration, net migration, in fact, doubled. So we're spending $3 billion a year in border enforcement to double the net rate of undocumented migration. <laughs> And, th and, and when I tell them this, Congress gets mad at me. <laughs> so this is just some statistics to, and this is from a much bigger model with all these controls you see at the bottom. But uh, this is the effect of the Border Patrol budget on crossing costs and the apprehension probability. It's actually sm slightly negative. It has no effect on apprehension probability because they just change their behavior. They m invest more in the crossing process. <clears throat> This is uh, the effect of a Border Patrol budget on the probability of taking a first and then a, an additional U.S. trip uh, with a bunch of other uh, contextual controls and a whole bunch of individual controls. And you see that the likelihood of taking a first trip is driven entirely by de employment demand in the United States. And it's totally unaffected. I mean, it's totally, it's zero, 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 zero out to the fourth decimal place by the Border Patrol's budget. And you can substitute any other indicator of border enforcement or immigration <coughs> enforcement in there and you get the same thing. So basically, you're spending billions of dollars, and you're not really deterring people from coming into the United States. However, you do deter them from coming again once they've been. So um, <clears throat> the last thing to look at, then, is the likelihood of returning to Mexico. And here you see, whether it's a first or a later trip, it's a negative, strong negative effect. You're reducing the likelihood that they go home. And so the net effect was to truncate circularity of the flow, which had been a characteristic feature of migration from Mexico for many, many decades, and turn it from a, a, a um, circular flow of male workers going to three states and transformed it within 10 years to a national population of families living in 50 states. <laughs> and guess what? The undocumented population, especially Mexicans, dramatically increased. You can see after the border mobilizations in 93 and 94, there's a doubling of, the, of this rate of undocumented population growth. The number of Latinos in the United States goes from uh, 10 to 50 million. Percentage Latino goes from 4.7% in 1970 to 16.3% by 2010. Uh, the origins of Latinos shift from native to foreign born. The, origin, the national origins shift away from the Caribbean towards Mexico and Central America. And now mass illegality is a characteristic feature of the Latino population in the United States. This is the percentage foreign born by national origin. This is a percentage of uh, illegal among foreign born and all Latinos. So around 60% of Mexicans, 60% of Salvadorans, 71% of Guatemalans, 77% of, uh, of Hondurans, immigrants present in the U.S. are currently illegal. And when you take it of the entire national origin, it's 21% of all persons of Mexican origin, 38% of all persons of Salvadoran, and so on, as you can see. And the population that's affected by this is even larger because this, this is showing uh, estimates of the percentage of Latino children living with an unauthorized parent. So the, peop the number of people affected by this mass illegality is even larger than the numbers I just showed. And the origins of the, the Latino population has shifted dramatically towards Mexicans. So this is my last slide. This is, uh, this is the feedback loop that led, led us to our current state of immobili political immobility and stasis in the United States. Congress 
between 65 and 76 <coughs> entails avenues for legal entry from Latin America. This leads to a rise in this, over the same period in undocumented migration, which raises the number of border uh, apprehensions, which produces a conservative anti-immigrant reaction, which produces more harsh uh, anti-immigrant policies, which increase the risks and costs of border crossing, which re reduce the rate of return migration, which leads to actually rapid undocumented population growth. If they'd done nothing at the border, uh, uh, after 1986, we would have at least half as many undocumented migrants in the United States as we do today. And, and that produces what we observe now uh, in the United States, this white racial black la backlash against the changing demography of the United States. In 2010, for the first time in American history, less than 50% of births were to white uh, European origin people. The rest were to Latinos, blacks, and Asians, and mixtures thereof. Uh, uh, currently, uh, Latinos alone are 25 percent of U.S. births. Uh, they're 16 percent of the population. They're projected to hit 25 percent of the population within a decade or so. Uh, and at this point, illegal migration has actually stopped. It's a, been a net of zero, and for Me Mexico, net zero or negative since 2008. Uh, legal immigration is continuing, and legal immigrants who used to stay in the United States, now they're the ones that are circulating. So, um, and because illegal migration has stopped, um, the <coughs> dynamic momentum of population growth has shifted to births. And so it's already locked into the demography of the United States. The percentage of Latinos is just going to keep rising and rising. Even if you hold immigration constant from now on, it will continue to rise because now births are taking over as the leading uh, sector. So we've got a bunch of uh, elderly white people in um, the heartland of America that are very discomfited by the fact that the United States is shifting from a white European society to a minority majority society where Latinos are the ascendant group, uh, blacks and Asians are also rising, uh, and uh, older white people are dying out. And that's the House Republican Caucus right there. Uh, and um, and it's, all, it's all occurred because of this feedback process that transformed a stable system, completely destabilized it, and changed it into a brand new system, which we observe today, where we have a fixed undocumented population north of the border circulating legal populations. And instead of going to three states, it involves 50 states. And that's my summary of the state of North America. <laughs>